Good evening, everyone. Wow, amazing to see you all packed in here. Welcome to Hauser & Wirth. I'm Russell Salmon, Director of Public Pro Programs here at the gallery. On behalf of Hauser & Wirth, MUBI, and The Office, we are thrilled to have you all here this evening to celebrate the exclusive worldwide streaming release of William Kentridge's brilliant series, Self-Portrait as a Coffee Pot. Filming for the series began in Kentridge's Johannesburg studio during the COVID-19 lockdown in 2020 and was completed in 2023. Following special previews at Toronto International Film Festival and BFI London Film Festival and its presentation at the Arsenale Institute for the Politics of Representation, curated by Carolyn Kristov Bakargiev during the Venice Biennale of Art 2024, which ends next month, the series was acquired and has been released by MUBI to stream exclusively on their platform. Tonight, we're honored to welcome artist William Kentridge, renowned for his animated drawings for projection, as well as his sculpture, theater, and opera productions, for a conversation with celebrated writer and cultural critic Lynn Tillman, whose new book, A Collection of Stories, titled Thrilled to Death, comes out in March. After the conversation this evening, you are all welcome to join us in the Roth Bar and the Bookshop for a drink to further celebrate. Before we get started, I have some very important special people to thank. Thank you to our friends at The Office and MUBI for their gracious collaboration on tonight's program, Noah Bashevkin and Rachel Chanoff at The Office, as well as Ibti Omer, Irene Musumeche, and Sanam Garagozlu, all of whom were pivotal in making this evening a reality. From the Hauser & Wirth team, thank you to our presidents, Ivan and Manuela Wirth and Mark Peo, as well as Anders Bergstrom, Marigold Freeland, Fiona Romer, Ellie Holly, Carolina Sabater, and Angelique Owens for all their support on this program. On your seats this evening is a custom William Kentridge designed movie tote bag, which includes a limited edition zine produced in honor of the series and also designed in collaboration with William Kentridge. Thank you all again for being here this evening. Before we begin this evening's conversation, please enjoy Mubi's beautiful trailer for William Kentridge's Self-Portrait as a Coffee Pot. When I was three years old, I wanted to be an elephant. I failed at that, so I was reduced to being an artist. The studio is both a physical place and a metaphoric space. It's a place of making and of making meaning. I prefer the solitary act of drawing. I prefer the companionship of collaborators. One of the hard things to realize is the edge of who one is, of what your imagination can produce. This is the job of the studio, to turn that which is invisible into something visible. So you start thinking you'll do a picture of the whole universe, but you end up with a coffee pot. And now please join me in welcoming William Kentridge and Lynn Tillman. It's an honor uh, to be talking with you. Um, I've been studying his films uh, this past week, cramming. Uh, and um, I wanted to say just generally, it's great to see these now, because the idea of imagination and optimism and all of those good things are sort of what we need now in the United States before our election. Uh, so um, I'm a novelist, and one of the ways in which I saw these films, these nine episodes, was as nine chapters. And they build in a narrative, as a narrative, over these nine 
um, episodes or, or chapters, but one of the things that remains constant is, well, two things. One is this, you're making these during COVID lockdown, and two, everything happens in the studio. And for you, the studio is an incredibly um, important place. And I was very, very engaged with the way you were talking about it because much of what many artists I spoke to for a long time were really saying that that shouldn't exist anymore, the studio. And, but you see it as a place of possibility of making mistakes. I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about that. Right, thank, thank you, Lynn. Firstly, let me say, I've always been astonished at people who can write a novel. And when I started this series, I thought, oh, well, maybe this is a chance to actually have a narrative, which is why at the end of the first episode, I say, well, maybe now it's, can we, I wish it could be a film where there's a body on the floor and there's a Central European uh, detective with a big moustache and he comes in and you know something's going to, something's going to happen. And I thought, okay, that sets me the challenge to do that throughout the series. And I failed miserably <laughs> at that. But so I'm very happy that you still feel there's a kind of arc across. There is. And the studio, it's, I mean, the studio in the first lockdown, as uh, I'm sure all over the world, there's very stringent lockdown. And although I could be in the garden and I was there with my wife and our children and one studio assistant, I decided that everything would happen only in the studio. I didn't want it to be saying, here's the city of Johannesburg, here's a history of South Africa, here we gradually approach it. And for it not to be a documentary, to decide it had to have a different voice. And not just a different voice, but a different form to what uh, a documentary is. At the time, you'll remember, at the beginning of COVID, there was a huge success of a, a documentary about someone who kept tigers. It was a big success on Netflix. And I thought, oh, God, I'm in a hiding to nothing. There, I have one small pussycat that can come into the series, but <laughs> there's not really a tiger, and there's no one's being mauled by it, and no one's being abused by someone else. So it was a question was, could one still make something that could be of interest, both to myself making it, but even potentially to people watching it, that had these parameters of not going outside the studio, not having an external voice. Um, and the studio, as you say, is it's, it's, it is, a, for me, an important physical space. It's not just a metaphor. Some people say their computer is their studio. Wherever they go, whichever hotel room they're in, that's their studio. And I always travel with a sketchbook, and I almost always return with the sketchbook untouched. I'm very bad at drawing in my hotel rooms. Um, it's because I do need the charcoal in the straw, the paper over there, the old drawing on that wall, the, the familiarity of the walk, knowing which straw I can find the right chamois leather to erase the paper. Um, and so it has a physicality to it, which is important, um, as well as the, the protection of it of saying one can, you're not being watched, even if there's a camera there, you can be as stupid as you like and it's kind of fine and okay. And that's difficult for a novelist to, to play in the same way, I think, because if you write a sentence, it still has to make sense as a sentence. Well, at one point you say something about language attaches us to the world. Yeah. I think that's farther um, into the series. And I was very, struck by that because, I mean, there are all psychoanalytic theories about when you take on language, you are sort of taking on the world. And making the studio a safe world during that period. But you, but you bring war into it in many different ways. And the first way, I think, is through, there's another you. Um, and you are in dialogue with yourself. And this is about the inner war. This is the interior that's asking itself questions. And many of the questions that you ask um, seem to me things that might be on other people's minds during COVID lockdown. 
I mean, there are, it became, it's, it was not the first time I'd done a kind of split of the self. Mm -hmm. The artist as maker, the artist as critic, the person who gives himself the benefit of the doubt, the one who's skeptical. In a strange way, it's kind of channeling my father, whose voice I kept hearing in myself. So I had a friend, and in the project we were doing, she was a beautiful song by Berlioz, and she was, we were talking about time running backwards. And so she trained herself to sing the song, parts of the song, in reverse. And she met my father, and he said, oh, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm singing in William's concert. And he said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm singing the song of Berlioz, and it's, I'm singing it in reverse. Oh, said my father, just remind me what it was that Berlioz got wrong when he wrote it forwards. <laughs> So that was kind of the skepticism I kept hearing in one of the two people talking, going, going through it. So your father was a kind of comedian also. Well, he was, a, yeah, and he still is. He's a kind of a, a skeptic. He's about to turn 102. And I said to him, how are you, Dad, the other day? And he said, well, I lead a very lazy life. And I said, well, at 102, you're allowed to lead a lazy life. He said, yes, I suppose I am. And it's, so that kind of... Yeah, it's part of it. The, 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 the thing about it, though, is I hadn't expected it to be so deeply inside me. The to, voice, his this voice. voice. This voice, sometimes it's my brother's voice, but these other voices, one thinks one's on one's own. I've seen photographs of uh, myself walking. I said, but that's where my father walks, and my grandfather with their hands behind their back. As, so the, the roots of habits that keep coming through us are yes. also there. Do you sometimes pass a mirror and think, Oh, there's my father's face, or there's my mother's face. Suddenly, you see it. Um, I do. I do sometimes, and it's uh, yeah. Um, again, with my stories of my father, he he was at an exhibition opening not so many years ago, maybe five years ago, and he was there, then aged only ninety-seven, and he said, you know someone came up and thought that I was the artist. So I said, oh. He said, well, yes, I suppose that was nicer for me than for you. <laughs> Speak, speaking about um, comedy or influences and the way you walk, uh, there were many um, comedians I thought of, but more from earlier time. I thought your walk was influenced by Groucho Marx. I thought there was something about Buster Keaton in, in some. And, and another reference I made was to the um, out of the inkwell. You know, because you're working with ink right. and charcoal, uh, there was a very early uh, animation series. Uh, and it was out of the inkwell, and there, the character that was created was Coco the Clown. That's right, to draw the world. Yes, and, and by the uh, animator would sort of dump some of the ink on a page and be working from that. I wondered if you... you I think there have been different versions of the line animating itself. Out of the inkwell, I think, was the first one. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure they're sitting somewhere in my head. Um, Buster Keaton in my dreams to have that sense of ability and timing and where to work it. There's one sequence in one of the episodes of a mirror um, with oh, myself yes. in the mirror, and that's that's obviously a fairly direct homage to Duck Soup. But that was that came not directly from that, but because I did a project about Trotsky in exile. And he was in exile in Turkey in 1933, which is the year that the Marx Brothers made Duck Soup. So I, I allowed kind of the Trotsky character to play with that double image in there. There's something, you know, to make, a, to make the fake mirror, you just make a frame and then you have the exact object on each side of it at the same distance and it fools you, even if you're actually in the space with it, that it's not a mirror. Until you walk in front and you said, oh my God, I must have disappeared, because there's no reflection. Much of your work seems like magic. And I know if I were interested in technical stuff, I would be asking you questions about how did you do this, how did you do that. But I'm more interested in the illusions that you create and why you create them. I know you started in theater, um, and I think your past probably as an actor or a dancer also, or um, your movements are so... Uh, 
directed in yourself, and then you direct others. I mean, the, the, the question about illusion and the, you're right, the technical, the deep technical part is not so interesting, and the technical, technical part of the editing, I couldn't really answer the questions about. They're very skilled editors working in the studio that are very up to date with what is contemporary, domestic, or, you know, not huge scale, but, and so they're enormous. But I'm, as you say, I'm interested rather in the fact that if you tear some sheets of paper and put them down on the table and you get a six-year-old to do it, they will arrange it and say, oh, look, that looks like a dinosaur, that looks like a whale, that looks like a... And so you're seeing the torn pieces of paper, that's kind of obvious, but you can't resist, it's not about a willing suspension of disbelief, it's an unwilling suspension of disbelief, of recognizing the simplified horse or elephant, or whatever the image is. Um, and then, as you say, the pleasure is understanding the pleasure we got from self-deception. Yes. From knowing we're seeing those two things and understanding how we can't resist make. And for me, it's, it's a lesson about how we need, how we have this absolute compulsion to try to make sense of fragments. Yes. It's like when you hear a foreign language and there's a word you don't really understand or someone, you miss something, you react as if it meant something. You're filling in a possible gap. And that's why I think the, the edge of translation is always interesting. It's interesting, two sociologists, eth ethnog ethnologists, have studied the fact that people who know each other well finish each other's sentences. And, but if you veer, if people who know each other, uh, one really veers deeply from what's expected, that creates a little tension. So the expectation that someone will say what you expect them to say, and then that doesn't happen, creates a, a problem. Um, I, I think that your background in theater and music, I mean, <clears throat> this is a guy who knows a lot of different things <laughs> and trying to keep up with all of that. But you bring it together in one of the episodes you're working with dancers and musicians and singers, and you direct all of them. You conduct in some ways, but with the dancers, you know, a lot of people, artists, talk about embodiment, and I've always thought that that's, um, that troubled me because I don't really think that anything gets embodied. But in your work, because you really want the, the drawing to become a character. Uh, you work with your dancers and you show them the gesture or the movement that you want them to make. And that, to me, is embodying uh, the, the, the idea. Yes, I've never thought of it as, as necessarily embodying it, holding the body in the image, but I'm very aware of the body as the origin of the, of the image, allowing yourself to kind of think from the neck downwards to see what is produced by the body, which is not just a movement, it's also often, I mean, to, to give a simple example, you can, you can make a drawing in which you're shifting all the way across and it's, uh, it carries that whole gesture. Yes. Or you can also just draw at the table and you're working from the shoulder, or you can just draw from the elbow or draw from the wrist, or you can also just draw with the knuckles. So there's a way in which the, you know, you can also draw in different, you can draw with a very loose line with very low tension, or a kind of neutral drawing like an architect, or someone who has desire that has to move, or with passion where the marks <laughs> shift, or with so much tension you can't even move anything at all, yes. which is like the one corresponds to no theater where there's so much tension you can't move. And with this great attention, passion, that would be like Commedia dell'arte. And then you might have a neutral one, and you'd have a really relaxed one, which is like contemporary movie making, where everybody's relaxed. So there are ways in which the, it's not that you're trying to incorporate that into the work, but it gives you a different set of ways of either talking to an actor or a dancer, or a, if you're teaching drawing, to teach it to. If I teach, if I show, if I ever teach drawing, it usually uses these theater exercises. 
as a way of saying, let's see what emerges rather than writing the essay in advance and then carrying it out. Well, you know, you talk in the film and there are captions and there's speaking um, and there are words that he will put on a drawing that he's working on. Um, you talk a lot about uncertainty, or not a lot, and yet you have a lot of certainty while you're, it, it appears when you're doing this work. I mean, there's, there's speed, certainly. And some of the, um, some of the appearance of certainty is uh, because it's all seen as provisional. So in other words, you can put a phrase down directly because you know you can also take it away and put another one down. Whereas if you know this is the only phrase you're going to have, then you think, my God, does it really encapsulate everything I want to, as a, to understand its subtext? Should it be there? But if you keep provisionality as a big category, um, it makes for a lightness and a possibility of, of movement and change, which may give the appearance of certainty because it's going fast. But behind the speed, there can be always a constant saying, this may be the right one, but it may not be. No. Um, thinking again about the gestures and the way you work with actors and dancers, I was very struck in, there's a, I think it's episode six, uh, when there's a, it's about World War I. Yeah. That's the larger context in which, the, the drama and the dance is, and they're happening. And you ask these two men um, to, the um, Africans, and because of colonialism, are being asked to fight in Europe on the side of wh whoever has dominated or is the colonist. And you want them to express a willingness and then an unwillingness. Like, they, they want to be part of this because they're part of this country. On the other hand, they know that this is not their fight. And the way in which you talk to them, it's an amazing way of, and the dancers react. You, you say yeah. to them, you know. You, the, the willingness the, and the not willingness. What yes. is it to have that? resistance in the body. But, I mean, the, the credit is to them. Uh, Gregory McCormer, who's one of the dancers there, um, I remember Julie Taymor, a New York, New York director, came to South Africa to, and uh, she saw him in a performance, and she, she couldn't understand why he wasn't the superstar in the world. She, she'd never seen a dancer as good as he was, and he is. He's one of the great great dancers. And so there were things that he could do and find in his body of going and retreating, of his chest wanting to take the pride of being part of this big European war and another part of him that would recoil from it. So I could give an impulse. I could give a, I could give a suggestion of that backwards and forwards, but to actually manifest it, that's his, that's his genius. That's like a kind a of, it is, to find that spasm of history. So I could say, let's find a spasm of history, and it kind of manifests in front of you in an extraordinary... At one point, um, you discuss, maybe early on, about landscape, and how when you were a child, you would see pictures of landscapes that were from Europe, and that the Johannesburg landscape was nothing like that, and that there was no vanishing point. And I, I, I would love you to talk about the reasons for there not being a vanishing point. Yes, I mean, it was, that was, it's part really of a bigger question of what was it to be, you know, in South Africa, a white Jewish boy in essentially not a Jewish world um, and not a European world but connected so closely to it. So there were, there was, I, don't know if, I don't think it existed in the United States, but a series of children's books about a boy called William. Uh, Just William, William Does It, or things like that. The 1940s children's books. And there were village, English village life. There was a vicarage. There was a stream. There was a forest. It was everything we didn't ever have. So there was a strange kind of identification through the name, but a separation from all the other things that weren't there. 
Um, and I sometimes think if, if I'd kept my, my familial name changed 100 years, 110 years ago, as Kantorovich, and then my great-grandfather invented this or changed it to this invented anglicized name, Kentridge. But I think if I'd stayed as Chaim Kantorovich, and not as William Kentridge, would have had a very different relationship to Englishness, to the English landscape, to all of those things. It's but very, it's so. very interesting how naming can, d with, in this discussion about landscape, you show the, um, the landscape as not having hills and valleys, but some mounds. And those mounds were created from digging uh, for go the gold mines, into the gold mines. And so there's an invisibility. Yes, but there's an invisibility and there's a, I mean, as you, you know, so the, the clarity of not having a vanishing point in a landscape. In traditional European landscape, you frame a landscape by the picturesque and there's usually a bit of a tree in the foreground and there's a bit of water somewhere and a shadow and a shape and a middle distance and a distance. We find that when we frame a picture with our phones, we kind of can't avoid trying to get that kind of the picturesque yes. into it. Um, and you can, you know, you can get that into most landscapes. At one point when I was trying to draw the Johannesburg landscape or the area, they would say, let's choose a random distance, drive that random distance, 12.3 kilometers, and then take a photo or make a sketch of the landscape to try to avoid the picturesque. And then I found that even however bleak it was, I was framing it like a traditional picture. So then the rule was, you then have to turn 180 degrees and work with whatever is facing you. It's very hard to avoid patterns of seeing and of training, the way our eyes are trained by all these histories of different, of, of you know, in my case, of seeing so many Western landscapes and the history of Western painting. But Johannesburg, if you actually look at it, as you say, there's no, it's one of the few cities in the world that's neither at the sea or at a river or at a trade route or at a mountain. So there's no geographic reason for it to exist. It has an entirely geological raison d'etre, which is to say the gold that is buried underneath it. So you hunt for, a, for some kind of logic in the landscape, and there isn't one really. I, I was very interested also in when he's drawing and working with charcoal, which is an, something else I wanted to ask you about. You use a ruler often. You draw lines. And it's as if in some ways you're making a map. <laughs> but it's not a map. It's something else. And, and I thought, is, is he trying to make something coherent? by using these lines? Um, I think there, there are two reasons for it. The one is that these large lines and large gestures on these blank sheets as a drawing start give a kind of a movement to the image of the, of the drawing, for the film, for these films. But usually those red lines come onto drawings much later when they began, and then they do act more like surveyor's beacons, an analysis of the landscape as it is made. But they kind of, now they exist some lines in advance, some halfway through, some towards the, the end. They're both construction lines to say, this feels the right place for a horizon or a different piece of civil engineering to come in. Uh, they're like you might have a forensic photograph, where you've got a photograph, and then you have marks on the photograph annotating different Thing. So the drawing and the information on top of the drawing. So they are like a kind of map making. Yeah, a kind of, a kind of map making. Um, you also, in the films, there's the use of, I guess, a big fan, because or something that makes pages go in the air. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion about, not a lot, but discussion with yourself, your other. Um, about uh, flying and about having dreams of flying. And then you draw birds and you make, and they flutter. And, and there is a literary reference I want to bring up. Yes. So, you have, so you have these, this kind of wind being created and pages flying around. And 
then you have a caption, and it says, the wind will speak. And I wondered, and I immediately thought of Pound's 50th, 70th canto, um, which is, I have tried to write paradise. Do not move, let the wind speak. That is paradise. Let the gods forgive what I have made. Let those I love try to forgive what I have made. So, I mean, Pound is interesting writing about paradise. At the end of um, Dante's Paradiso, mm -hmm. the very end, the sort of the page before the end, he talks about uh, the leaves of the Sibyl. The Sibyl used to write your fortune on a leaf. Mm -hmm. And the story was you'd go to get the answer from the Sybil, but as you went to get your leaf, a wind would blow up. So you never knew if the leaf you were catching had your fate on it or someone else's fate. So in that regard, um, Dante writes about the leaves being spread by the wind. And at the very, almost the second last line of Paradiso, he talks about and says, I'll paraphrase it, I don't remember it, but like, and so were the leaves of the Sibyl gathered together in a single book. So it's kind of, they swirled around and then they've gathered into a book, which is, of course, Dante's book, yes. which becomes Pound's book, is his yeah. kind of. Um, but the idea of the wind and the blowing them up, I was also interested in thinking of the, anti, the resistance to entropy in the studio, that things aren't all going to get, that order is going to break down more and more and more, which is the law of entropy, that if you shatter a vase and throw the fragments in the air, it's highly unlikely they're going to land back again into exactly the shape of the, it's the statistical improbability that's the basis for, for entropy. But of course, in the studio, you can do that because you can start with the fragments, you can throw them in the air, and they line, land back as this perfect vase every time provided you run the film backwards. Um, and that's possible in the studio. So the wind that you saw, in fact, is usually three of us with uh, big pieces of cardboard flapping. And so you make a careful drawing out of tiny pieces of paper. And then you blow it up into the air and wave it so it's swirling around. And of course, it lands it's just a mess on the floor. You spend <laughs> half an hour picking it up. But if you run the film backwards, you start with all the swirling air, all the leaves of the Sybil, and then they just with one, they make themselves into the perfect image. They gather themselves in the book of the Sybil. When you, speaking of Greek myths, or yeah. just myths in general, um, when you, you talk several times to yourself, your other, or your brother, I began to think this was your brother, um, about your father uh, telling you or reading you these myths when you were seven years old. And they're myths that are quite disturbing. And you say uh, several times, and he read them to me when I was seven years old. And then you don't talk about their impact on you. But one, one as a viewer, I'm thinking, what, what does this mean? How did this affect him? Well, they, they affected me. I mean, it's in, I remember very clearly the story of Perseus and how he comes back and he goes into the athletics competition and he throws the discus and you know, the oracle has said he will kill his grandfather and his grandfather has run away because he knows Perseus is coming back and he, his grandfather disguises himself as an old man with ashes and sackcloth and Perseus throws the discus and it goes up into the crowds and there on the back row, this discus strikes and kills an old man in ashes and sackcloth. And that's his, grandfather. and that's his grandfather's that he right. couldn't have. So this was, I remember being shocked by, oh my God, why didn't the man just sit one seat to the left or one seat to the right. We could have avoided, why did he, Perseus have to be a show off? Why did he have to show off with his discus throw? So for me, it was, I remember that very clearly. And I said to my sister recently, who's 18 months older, I said, do you remember the train journey? He said, yes, I remember the train journey very carefully, clearly. And I said, do you remember the story of Perseus? And he said, no, had no, didn't touch sides at all. So the different moments when something Catch. I think as a seven-year-old, maybe seven-year-old's a key 
In some countries, seven year old was the age, seven years was the age at which you were allowed to give legal evidence in a court case. But there's something in that sort of age. He was a lawyer, but I remember it was my grandfather saying, you've turned seven, now you are old enough to give evidence in court. Oh. <laughs> and I thought, what, what is, is so a court? Brave. What is evidence? But that's fine. <laughs> but I think what one does have at a young age is a burning sense of injustice. That's so unfair, you say, when something's done. Mm. You can't stay up or something. That sense of justice as fairness. And this seems so unfair because he didn't want to kill his grandfather. Why should it happen this way? So they're, f they're images like that which stick with you. And I think those childhood impressions are a bedrock we go back to. We become so inured to shock, to evil, to things like that. That one has to sometimes go back to an early memory of it to remember how viscerally things felt right or wrong. There are two thoughts that come to mind. One, uh, they can be answered differently, but one is about your interest in fate, and the other, I think, coming out of that would be, or I think psychologically, psychoanalytically, I would think that your interest in transformation has a lot to do with this idea of unfairness. How can we change that? What can I put there instead? I mean, I think the, I mean, there's a whole separate, this is, I'm interested in, uh, not, not as an analyst and not even really as a patient who's been through analysis, but I'm interested in some of the parallels between the psychoanalytic situation and the studio. They're both, they're both, or both supposed to be safe spaces for stupidity. There's no <laughs> statement you can make that's not allowed in the psychoanalytic circumstance. Let's start with the statement and see what it becomes or what it reveals. Or So that sense of giving an image the benefit of the doubt or a line the benefit of the doubt has something. And I'm not sure if the drawing is the, the analyst or the analyzant, but <laughs> there is that kind of, what do you recognize what comes out? Um, of it. And fate, fate I became interested as a kind of, when we were working on the Sybil, suddenly you're doing this reading. But there was another question you had, the second question. Um, no, there were two. One was about fate and one was about transformation. Oh, transformation. Yes. So one of the things about um, conventional animation and general animation is um, with a lot of the great animation like Tex Avery, it's about transformation without cost. So you're walking along and a safe falls on your head and you become a completely flat object, but then you reform yourself and you go on. So it's, um, and I'm a big fan of Tex Avery and of that school of, of animation and I wish I could do it like that. But with me somehow it's really difficult to imagine the transformation of a cat into a telephone and so there's a kind of cost of labor of that being done. But what really strikes me about, and this is a, this a psych, does also relate to trauma and psychoanalysis, is that in a lot of the great stories of metamorphosis and transformation, the transformation or the metamorphosis is a response to danger or trauma. So you have uh, a story of a uh, wife who's killed the children and fed them to the husband because he's been unfaithful with her sister. And the husband discovers this and um, chases his wife through the palace, this Greek palace, with his sword to kill her. And she's being chased by her husband. And in her panic, she transforms into a bird and is able to fly off and become a nightingale in the forest or a swallow under the eaves of the house. So it's the pressure of that terror. and. Uh, I told a story when my daughter was three. I was telling her a story and it was about how there was a doggy and a kitty and the doggy was chasing the kitty and then the kitty came and ran through the cat flap and was saved. And then a little while later she was talking to my wife and she said, what was the story daddy was telling you? She said there was a, a doggy and a kitty and then the doggy was chasing the kitty and the kitty flapped her wings and escaped. 
because she she could understand the word flap, but didn't know the idea of a cat flap. And somehow I had to make sense of the chase and the panic and the word flap. And so it became the wings. So I think it's also, it's both about transformation as a trying to make sense of fragments, which otherwise wouldn't make sense. It's like when you don't understand a word and you imagine what that word might mean or you misheard something, you have to make that, make that leap. You become complicit in making the meaning. Yeah. Uh, I, I think there's not that much time, but one thing that I really wanted to discuss with you was your interest in Dada. And the way in which that comes through is, is I think, ex extremely impressive. When you're talking, um, when this, in the section about World War I and about the enforced labor of these African, of Africans to fight in World War I, you're working with actors at this point and instead of regular English or any regular language, you, have, you begin to talk gibberish. And I thought this was so extraordinary because what it represented to me was in a situation like that, in this war, you know, the absurdity and the horror of sending these men to war to fight for something that they shouldn't, or just war in general, they lose language. There is no way to, to talk about this absurd um, condition. I think that, yeah, that, that's definitely, I mean, that's where the, the text we're performing, or the text that we're saying is, it's, it is gibberish, but it's German gibberish. It's, um, it's Kurt Schwitter's Ursonata. Um, <laughs> Which we've been playing with as a performance piece. I mean, fums povatats are all pogif qui air, to desent nur ie and puff tilf to til juka, juka, yeah, rinska, ratka, rakta rinska, rakta rinska, rakta rinska. It continues in this, in this way. So it is about language breaking down, which was obviously clear in, um, at the time of the First World War, that was a big idea of it. If such good, clear, rational European logic had brought to the bath this destruction of Europe in the First World War, let's find a less good, a less good logic, a less good language. So it's a, a demonstration of that. But there's also a kind of crazy pleasure in this. Uh, in this, uh, I, I, I used to do with my two-year-old granddaughter. We would talk nonsense gibberish to each other. Till at a certain point, I could see her thinking this is a little bit childish of my grandfather, <laughs> and uh, I'll humour him for a bit, but then I'll go off and do something else. But there is, I mean, the 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 playing with as if it might mean something, but it hovers at the edge of. of and I guess one other thing is about the use of your charcoal, of charcoal, uh, which comes from a tree and is burned and compressed. And why, I mean, and it can never really be erased. And that, to me, speaks to the importance of history in all of your work. It is a, a story I've recounted, so it may be in the series, but when I started doing charcoal drawings and filming the drawings, which is the basis of the animations, drawing and redrawing, erasing, redrawing, erasing, redrawing, I tried as hard as I could to get a perfect erasure, to leave a clean paper behind. I tried different kinds of paper, different Italian, different French paper. I tried on plastic. Um, and I tried different erasers, electric erasers, rubbing it with breadcrumbs, all sorts of different ways. But there'd always be this gray trace. And for the first couple of films, I would spend half the time showing them apologizing to people, saying, um, it's going to get better. I'm still trying to find the right eraser, and it won't have this ugly smudge behind it, until somebody said, stop complaining. In fact, the smudge is the interesting part. And then I did, oh, let's recalibrate. OK, all right, sorry, yes, the smudge is interesting. It's good. It shows things. And so in fact, as you say, the smudge carries with it a whole thematics of history, of memory, of time passing, of making things palpable, which are otherwise invisible. But that's something, so I, my feeling wasn't, oh, how clever of a, am I to have shown a way of doing it. It was much more, how stupid am I not to have seen what it was telling me, the technique. And so I suppose that's, that and other things have been the belief in giving the image the benefit of the doubt, in that hopefully the drawing is smarter than the person making it. <laughs> I, I think we 
we're supposed to? Uh, I'm not sure, Russell. If, if you have another question. Oh, if I have another question, but are we taking any questions from the? No. Okay. <laughs> Do I have another? <laughs> um, I I think the way in which your work um, mixes memory and history has a, a kind of perhaps specificity to your autobiography because you grew up in this land um, with this horrible system and that that must have infused so much of your early life going into and your parents were very very involved in uh, seeking justice and so Watching your films, I saw this interplay of memory and history, and it's it's evoked beautifully in your discussions with yourself. This antagonist, the protagonist, antagonist, back and forth. Because toward the end, you're arguing with yourself. Does this mean anything? What what have we been doing in the studio? Is, is it meaningful? I don't want to give away the end, but because what happens is very beautiful. Um, there's, there's one line that uh, comes from my wife in the, in the end. There's a discussion about, oh my God, what to do with all this, all this paper that's accumulated, all these thousands of drawings done over these years. And uh, uh, a dealer once, or an art and gallerist, an art gallery, and a, once said many, many years ago to my wife, oh, well, what will you do with all this paper when William dies? And she just said, big bonfire. <laughs> <laughs> so then I allow myself in one of the answers to this. So the odd phrases that have come from different pasts. I don't have other questions. I mean, I do. I have, uh, you know, you could go on and on. When you see the films, you'll see that it's endlessly interesting and provocative in all sorts of ways. But do you have a question for yourself? <laughs> <laughs> no, the one of me says, no, I think that's, that's good. <laughs> and the other one says, yes, that's fine. <laughs> and the, the, it used to be the argument would go, the one would say, all right, now it's, OK, it's time. Let's head back to the hotel to bed. And the other would say, are you crazy? It's only 8 o'clock at night. There's life outside. There are parties. Let's go on. And they said, well, I'm tired. I'm going back. And they said, well, I can't believe you're so feeble. Come on. Come on. There's, there's life. You're giving up overnight. And uh, he said, all right, well, I'll be there when you come back. <laughs> sometimes the one would win, sometimes the other. It's changed now. now it's, but, but it is still early. I'm not heading back. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you.